Charles Manson, Helter Skelter, the Tate LaBianca murders. It was the summer of 1969, August 9th to be exact, when actress Sharon Tate, who was eight months pregnant at the time, and three of her friends were savagely murdered in her home in Los Angeles. Tate was stabbed 16 times while she begged for the life of her baby, and then they used her blood to write pig on the front door of her home. Her former fiancé, Hollywood hairstylist Jay Sebring, was stabbed seven times and shot once. Wojtek Frykowski, a friend of Tate's husband Roman Polanski, was shot twice, hit on the head 13 times, and stabbed 51 times. Coffee heiress Abigail Folger, who was Frykowski's lover, was stabbed 28 times. Stephen Parent, an 18-year-old boy who was visiting the caretaker of the Tate residence, was also found dead on the scene, shot four times in his car. The next day, wealthy grocery store chain owner Lino Labianca and his wife Rosemary were also brutally murdered inside their home. Lino was stabbed 12 times and punctured with a carving fork 14 times. The knife was left stuck in his neck while the carving fork was still protruding from his stomach. The word war was carved on his stomach as well. Rosemary was stabbed 41 times. Both victims had pillowcases over their head and a lamp cord tied around their necks. On the living room's wall, the words death to pigs and rise were written in blood. The words helter skelter were also written in blood, this time on the refrigerator door. According to testimony given by one of the Manson family members, the murders were committed under the orders of Charles Manson. What kind of person could direct others to commit such heinous acts? Was he delusional? Did he really believe that killing those people would trigger an apocalyptic racial war? Or did he just con his followers into believing his lies because he wanted them to vent his anger against the world? What social and psychological factors could have influenced his upbringing to cause him to feel such cold-blooded malice against others? Join us as we search for answers as to why Charles Manson and his family were able to commit such terrifying acts. We'll look at the different social and psychological factors that could have contributed to this outcome. Please note that we are not here to look for excuses for these crimes, but we'd like to understand and educate people about how something so horrible could happen. Charles Manson was born in 1934 to a 16-year-old girl, Kathleen Maddox, and local laborer and conman, Walker Henderson Scott, whom his mother had believed to be an army officer. Shortly before he was born, Charles's mother married another laborer, William Eugene Manson. William divorced Kathleen because of her drinking and gross neglect of duty. Aside from alcohol, his mother was believed to have a penchant for men. She also repeatedly abandoned him. Sometimes she left him with neighbors, supposedly for just an hour, but wouldn't return for days or weeks. She supposedly sold him to a local waitress who wanted children in exchange for a pitcher of beer. Though the sale never really did push through, much of Manson's early childhood was spent bouncing around between relatives and boys' reform schools, especially after his mother was imprisoned for armed robbery. According to the forensic psychologist who conducted his psychological assessment in 1997, Dr. Todd Roy, Manson stole a neighbor's Christmas presents and set them on fire when he was seven. From age nine, he was in and out of institutions for various crimes, including petty larceny, burglary, and auto theft. According to testimonies given by Manson's sister, cousin and childhood acquaintances, Manson has always been quite manipulative. In first grade, he was able to manipulate some of his classmates, mostly girls, to attack students that he didn't like. When confronted by teachers, he would state that he couldn't be held responsible for his classmates' actions because they were simply doing what they wanted. No one thought that a six-year-old would be capable of manipulating others to such an extent, so Manson usually wasn't punished along with his followers. According to his first cousin, Joanne, Manson often lied, blaming others for wrongs that he had done. He also liked being the center of attention, deliberately misbehaving in front of adults. Joanne also revealed that Manson had been fascinated with guns and sharp implements such as knives since he was young. 
He had even tried to attack her with a razor-sharp sickle when she offended him. When confronted by his aunt and uncle, he told them that it was Joanne who had attacked him first. He was merely defending himself. When word reached his hometown about his involvement in the Tate LaBianca murders, no one was surprised. Though he did have others do his dirty work, Manson was also quite capable of being violent himself. If he felt insulted or slighted, he would personally take revenge. At age 13, he was raped by two older boys while in juvenile detention. He took revenge by beating one rapist bloody using a heavy window crank and hiding the weapon underneath the other boy's bunk. Manson was never caught. At age 17, he had become the aggressor, raping another inmate while brandishing a razor. Probation reports on Manson described him as someone unpredictable, safe only under supervision, and constantly striving for status and securing some kind of love. The reports also stated that Manson was suffering from a marked degree of rejection, instability, and psychic trauma. By 1967, Charles Manson had already spent more than half of his life behind bars. He was so used to living this way that he even requested to stay. He was denied. By the time Manson was released, much had changed in the outside world. Manson was suddenly faced with the hippie counterculture revolution of ultimate freedom. He was fascinated by the lifestyle, the openness and acceptance of the people. There was sexual freedom, dope, acid music, the occult, peace rallies, astrology, underground movements. The unconventional lifestyle was greatly appealing to Manson. He moved to San Francisco in the summer of 1967, just months after his release from prison. He began to attract a small following, mostly women. In the fall, his group traveled in a Volkswagen bus going as far as Alabama. They picked up new people and left behind those who didn't fit in. The group grew over time. By the summer of 1968, his inner circle had grown to more than 20 people. The family continued to grow. Manson, who had learned how to play the guitar in prison, talked about pursuing a music career. They headed for Los Angeles, bouncing around the area before settling at Span Ranch, just north of LA by late August 1968. Span Ranch used to be an old film and television set. In exchange for living there, the group would repair the ranch and take care of the horses. The family did everything together. They ate together, sang together, did drugs together, had orgies together. They did anything they wanted together, including stealing cars and credit cards. And all of them listened to Charles talking about the coming Armageddon. Inspired by the song Helter Skelter by the Beatles and the Book of Revelations, Charles predicted that there would be a race war. The black man was going to rise up and start killing the whites, causing a racial holocaust. He believed that the black man would triumph. It was karma, but Charles also believed that the black man was inferior to him. They wouldn't be capable of governing themselves. They would need leadership. He, Charles Manson, and his family would hide out in the desert in a secret world underground during the racial war. They would only come out once it was over to mentor the black community on how to rule the new society. At the same time, Manson's musical aspirations had come to a halt. He was able to mingle freely with Hollywood royalty and other wealthy influential people thanks to his friendship with Dennis Wilson, the drummer for the Beach Boys. It was through Wilson that he met Terry Melcher, a music producer who had lived in the Tate house previously. In fact, Manson had visited Melcher in that house before, trying to get a record deal. According to some of the family members, Manson became increasingly fixated on stardom, but his dream didn't come through. He wasn't going to be able to start his music career, despite having been told by many how great his music was. Many experts believe that this rejection caused him to shift his focus to violence and unleashing Armageddon. Because they were the ultimate beneficiaries of the racial war, Manson told his followers that it was their responsibility to trigger its beginning, showing the African Americans what they should do. The Tate-LaBianca murders were just the tip of the iceberg. 
According to one of Manson's followers, they had a list of people to be killed and mutilated. This list included Frank Sinatra, Elizabeth Taylor, and Steve McQueen. The Manson family wanted to target people whose deaths would shock the world and make them take notice. Over the years, many have tried to analyze the mind and motivations of Charles Manson as well as his followers. It is clear from what we've uncovered that he didn't have the happiest of childhoods, and he did have a history of manipulating people to do his bidding. Of course, it also can't be discounted that the 60s lifestyle contributed to the outcome. But was that all there was to it? Recently, a group of experts reviewed the notes and data gathered from the comprehensive psychological evaluation Dr. Todd Roy conducted on Manson in 1997. Dr. Roy's assessment at that time was that Manson had an antisocial personality and was a psychopath. The team concurred. They found that Manson was aggressive and antisocial. He also met the criteria for psychopathy. He had a grandiose sense of self and exhibited callous manipulative use of others. One of the members of the team was Dr. Joni Mahura, a psychology professor at the University of Toledo with an expertise in assessing psychosis. According to her, the data collected during that assessment showed that Manson was not schizophrenic, answering the question many had asked over the years. He was narcissistic, though, which fueled his need to be the center of attention at all times. She believed that his crazy persona was fake, an act to maintain the attention of the media, as well as distract them from asking about the murders and his part in them. Dr. Mahora also states that Manson was mildly manic-talkative, full of energy, driven and in control. He also had difficulty showing empathy and having intimate relationships. According to the psychologist's review, Manson's mental illness was most likely caused by his traumatic childhood. He might also have been driven by personal grievances such as humiliation, anger and blame. Terry Melcher, a music producer who refused to record Manson's songs, used to live in the Tate residence. He had even visited Melcher there before. According to the Manson family members, they already knew Melcher was no longer living there, but Manson wanted to frighten him. The psychologists also found that the severity of Manson's psychopathy prevented him from being morally upright. His grandiose fantasy of becoming the world leader, coupled with his personal grievances, could have pushed him to do something so horrific. Manson's traumatic childhood, his narcissism, violent tendencies and manipulative personality, coupled with the hippie counterculture, the rejection of the music industry, the influence of drugs which could lower his inhibitions about killing, and his grandiose fantasies which were fueled by his interest in the Book of Revelations and obscure cult churches such as Church of the Final Judgment. All these factors brewing in one pot, it was like the perfect storm. That's not to say that it was excusable, but maybe it was inevitable. Without the right programs and interventions that could have directed him away from this violent pathway, Charles Manson would eventually become a danger to the world. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.